Folks, the moment you've all been waiting for, it's finally here. Expected by whom? We're back. And as always, joined by Sean Shapiro. Sean, how we doing? We're good. Unlike uh, teams in the second wild card spot in the Eastern Conference, we are happy to be here. Yeah, we are absolutely happy to be here. You know, it's been a lengthy time off. I think our last episode was back in October and appreciate everybody that stuck with us. You know, we had to take a little bit of a hiatus as, you know, both Sean and I had various family situations come up. I think I'll speak for me personally in that, uh, as most of you know, my, my nephew is still waiting for a heart transplant. And so, just uh, hoping any day now that that takes care, you know, and, and, and a heart comes in, comes through for him. But it's been a bit of a stressful period, but we are now in a good spot where he's stable, just waiting. And so we can pick things back up. So without further ado, we've got a jam-packed episode here for you. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the NHL general managers meeting that always brings fun conversations uh, a nice interview with John Matisse of the score going over the state of analytics in the NHL. And then ultimately a fun um, a fun doubleheader that you got to cover, Sean, in Detroit recently with the uh, the Wings game followed by the, uh, the PWHL game there, talking a little bit about how things are going there. So without, uh, without much more delay, let's get right into it with the general manager's meeting. And you brought this up to me. So I'm going to turn it right back to you before I even talk about it is one of the most fascinating things that's been talked about at this uh, general manager's meeting is one of the proposed rule changes where teams would have the ability to review a puck out of place situation. Uh, and specifically, they can review in that situation if it's a puck over the glass where potentially you got shot out and you think it was a deflection that may have led to that happening. And then they also may be able to review those friendly fire high sticking penalties where, Hey, actually we think the teammate got them. It wasn't, it wasn't my player here, but the caveat to that being that if the coach is wrong, the team will have to kill a five on three penalty. So I got to ask, is this, is this enough? Does this <laughs> go too far? Are we going to slow the game down? Like what, what is your vibe on what's going to happen with this rule change? Should it be implemented? Uh, yeah, my my first reaction to it was so I saw the news and um, I actually texted uh, Kelly Forbes, who is the uh, I've, if you've written my site before, Kelly is the was the Stars video coach for the Dallas Stars video coach for about fifteen years before um, getting out of the NHL after last season and is now to to focus on being with his family and everything like that. And so I texted it to Kelly. And uh, Kelly had quite the record on challenges in the NHL during his career and everything. And he, uh, his, his, he, his quick take on it was, he says, I love this. He says, but I think most video guys are actually going to hate it because it's one of those things where a lot of um, video guys are so good now on the offsides. Like if you look at in general, if, if a video coach and, and, and when do we hear the video coach's name right or wrong? We hear it on, on the challenge. And so he was kind of, uh, Kelly said that I think some video coaches are going to hate this because all of a sudden they're going to be more so under the microscope on some things. And it's, it's going to be really interesting to me to see how some coaches, uh, use this right because um i have a feeling it's going to be kind of similar to how some coaches view goalie interference it's one of those things where it might be and i asked bruce cassidy about this earlier this week i was out in vegas working on a story for ep rinkside and he brought up how sometimes with goalie challenges his team might be down he laid out scenarios like we might be down three nothing and we're probably going to lose that challenge but you're down three nothing so you're going to go for it like you're going to you're going to see and if we win this one great may even if we get the penalty where you know what we're down 3 nothing who knows it's 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 one of those tools in the coach's bag um this one is going to be really interesting to me because i actually had i actually reached out to a couple coaches on a couple other topics this week and i was actually surprised how many still are proponents of the puck over glass remaining a penalty like, I, like it, it's, we sometimes hear that, um, like it's an antiquated rule and everything like that. But a lot of coaches I reached out to this week kind of says like, I know it's an antiquated rule, but I want, but it's the rule you need because I don't want 
in game, I don't want in a playoff game or a key game, a team is stuck and a guy just flips the puck over the glass to kill a play. Like it's, 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 it's a, it is a, it's not a, it's one where we, we kind of like, like, well, who would do that? But coaches are like, yeah, I would have coached a guy to do that. If that was a tool I had in my bag to kill a penalty, I would, like one coach told me straight up, it's like, if we're getting hemmed in and that's against the, and that's, and that's within the rules, I a hundred percent am telling my players to flip the puck over the glass to get the whistle. That is a hundred percent. Okay. So that was one interesting reaction I got to it. I, I think it is very close to opening, in my personal opinion is, I think it's very close to opening Pandora's box too far, personally. I think when you start to go and say the friendly fire on the high stick, um, that's the one to me that starts to get a little bit risky for me because all of a sudden, when's the first time a coach is now going to be like, well, my guy didn't, that guy tripped over his own feet. I now want you to go and review that penalty or you didn't actually cross check that guy. I I think to me, I actually, I don't mind. I wouldn't mind the puck over the glass one. I'm actually fine with that one because I think that's a black and white one. Um, But I I think the high sticking one to me, and I'm interested to hear your take on this. To me, that's too close to opening Pandora's box where all of a sudden we can see every penalty reviewed and then we start to go down a path I really don't want to go down. Yeah, you know, the high-sticking one, I'll start with that first. You know, already as as the rule stands, right, it has to be a, a called at least a double minor in order for it to be reviewed. Now that's sort of changing it to where really any minor with a coach's challenge could be reviewed for high-sticking here. Now, the deterrent to that challenge being you would have to go to a five-on-three as opposed to a five-on-four. I actually think it's fine based on the success of NHL power plays recently. We've seen power play kind of proficiency go up over the last several years to where now like a league average power play is around 20%. Whereas we used to think of some of the better league power plays being about 20 to 22%. You know, you're, you're average if you're at 20% now. So that's basically telling you, you know, just at a standard power play, that's what we would expect. And then, Furthermore, for a five on three being a full two minutes, you know, you can go back and take a look at uh, work done from 2008 by Gabe Desjardins uh, behind the net, which basically showed that if a five on three went for about 80 seconds, the probability of a power play team scoring was about 50 percent. And so you're that's pretty high. And and now we're talking about a full two minute power, uh, you know, five on three power play. Obviously, not every team is going to be as proficient as the next, and there will be certain, you know, uh, inherent differences from game to game. But I do think that is enough of a deterrent to prevent a coach from willy-nilly using that challenge. Uh, I, I think that's that's definitely come into play w- recently with, with teams getting better and better on the power play. You know, so so I'm actually fine with that, with the way that's laid out. I, I do think... The puck over glass one, I'm a little more, you know, sketch about because it, it really does come down to zap or film sometimes and, and, and trying to identify, like, did that puck move slightly, uh, you know, to figure it out? I mean, we already see enough of this with trying to figure out if a puck is across the goal line or if a puck was tipped above, you know, above the crossbar height on a goal that I think this is going to be even tougher to do. And again, having the threat of a five on three there. Uh, it's going to be very, very challenging for coaches to really effectively use it. So I personally would be surprised to see this used all that much. And I think if anybody's out there looking for an analysis to do, you can go back and track down Matt Cain's uh, article from 2016, that, or sorry, 2017, that actually looked at how certain you need to be on an offside challenge and calculated what the break even point should be based on what the score state is for your team and how many minutes are left in the game. I bet you could do a similar analysis here uh, uh, for both the high sticking and and the uh, um, puck over glass rule to kind of get that same sense of what, what level of confidence do I need to have that I'm right in order to actually make this challenge. And I think it would surprise a lot of people that it's not going to be all that different from the offside challenge, at least in my opinion. And I, and I think that's fine. I, I, I actually think the penalty, I think the deterrent is built in well enough. 
I just, I worry about the precedent this sets in the future, I think. It's it's not necessarily, I don't have any issue with this impact of the game. It's more of, I worry that at next year's GM meetings, someone says, hey, I want to be able to review if you got, if my guy was actually tripped. I want to be able to review if... Um, if this was actually a cross check, that's that's more so my worry on it. My worry, like I don't mind the game application of these. That's that's kind of I, I get it. I think there's enough of a deterrent. I just worry about going down the path of opening up this to where a GM who voted for this, and we know most of them did because this is it's been recommended to the competition committee. I just I just worry about someone getting emotional in the playoffs and feeling their team was jobbed in the playoffs because of a missed slash or a trip or whatever, and now all of a sudden that gets brought up with the precedent being, well, we can now review puck over glass. So we can review high stick. I want to be able to I want to be able to review review this. I I just I just worry about going down that path from a procedural long term Pandora's box type level. In game application, I'm I think it's enough of a penalty and punishment and everything like that. Um, and I actually had kind of on the, the usage standpoint, you bring up the Matt Cain article and we'll make sure to get the link to, to Ryan, to, to link in, in, in the bio on this as well. Um, I, I, I brought this up to uh, Bruce Cassidy earlier this week. I asked him just with the current challenge perspective, like what's his line for challenging things in the current system? And he was saying kind of one of the conversations they'll quickly have with their video coach will be. They'll relay over the microphone. Okay, what's your feel on this? Is this a hundred percent? Is this a fifty-fifty? Is this a seventy-five percent? And basically, to paraphrase Cassidy on this, if it's a hundred percent, obviously they're challenging it. But if it was a fifty-fifty, that's where the head coach says, "Okay, now this one's on me whether we're going to do it or not." And it's going to be, um, and that's kind of the emotional thing. And I've actually read the article that you've mentioned about the, that Matt wrote. I think, as you said, it was 2017. I, I probably, I'll pull those probably all together and probably put something kind of a company to go with this later this week. Um, just to kind of, that's kind of the emotional level of this where this becomes, I, I think in game usage, this becomes similar to the break glass in case of emergency, the quick goalie pull. I, th- I think it's going to be kind of, kind of one of those tools more so than something you see on a nightly basis and as long as it stays here i'm okay with it i just don't want to go to the point where next gm meeting you've got a gm saying we missed five slashes in the playoffs i now want i i I want to be able to i want to be able to do that because i think that's also at the end of the day you get into an issue with if you go down that path no one's going to want to ref hockey at this end of the day we still need the human beings to want to ref hockey at the end of the day too so what you're saying is you want to avoid what tennis has basically done, which is removed all of the lines people now, and all the li- all the calls are actually made by Hawkeye cameras um, with really very little ability to to push back and whatever the call is, the call is. Um, you know, so I, I definitely agree on the Pandora's box aspect of things. I think one of the saving graces right now is there's only one coach's challenge, um, and so it, 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 in sort of the break glass in case of emergency. They can still at least only do it one time, and it's not a scenario where if there's any fans of college basketball that are about you know ready to watch March Madness, you know you get under the two minute mark and every out of bounds play is reviewed, and all of a sudden the last two minutes are taking twenty minutes because every time the ball goes out, somebody's calling review that, review that, review that, and it 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 really completely just changes the dynamic of the game, and it's completely. Uh, implausible to to be able to continue. And that's why it's limited to only two minutes there. Um, You know, so if there is a scenario where you start to see these trickle in and then you start to see coaches saying, Hey, I want to get my challenge back. If I'm right, I want to get my challenge back. If I'm right. That's when I'm going to start to be concerned that there's a, there's really a box that's been opened that you can't do anything about. Um, But I think you have an opportunity at least by doing this with only one or two plays uh, with a strong deterrent, we can start to see how it's used um, before really you kind of have to dig that, you know, dig your grave and you're going down that way or you're not. And and I'm with you. I don't think you want to go down the way where everything is reviewable, anything can be challenged, and now you're dealing with multiple challenges a game from coaches if they're, if, you know, if they get their challenge back. 
for being right. So, so I think that is definitely something the NHL has to have, you know, total grasp on before they go too far. The, the other issue with uh, replay and challenges and everything like that is um, a lot of rule changes the NHL can test run in the AHL. Um, three on three overtime, even though the AHL does initiate a lot of that stuff by themselves, but three on three overtime, people will remember before we got in the NHL, the AHL tested this hybrid seven minute format where it was, uh, four on four for the first three and a half minutes and the first whistle after three and a half, they did three minutes and it was a seven minute overtime session. Um, we had hybrid icing tested in the AHL. This isn't something you can test in the AHL because you don't have the technology, right? Like the, in the, you don't have the video replay ability. Like there's a lot of things that happen in the NHL that I personally would love to see tested in the NHL. I mean, sorry, in the, in the, in the American Hockey League. And this isn't one where you can do that. This is one where it's not like we can go get data because the technology and the replay usage in the AHL is not up to snuff on the on the video that we have for NHL games. So it's kind of one of those where with the NHL, we're kind of <clears throat> all in basically on the, on the league doing this themselves. Um, if we can, if we can have it and have it stay as is, I will be all aboard. It's just, I, I, and there's the skeptic in me that is, we push, um, because and and rarely do we see sports rarely do we see sports sometimes get better on instant replay i feel like we only ever we like we always end up like you mentioned tennis right now everything's only the hawkeye system we're now as we're talking about this i was reading a story earlier today we're going through a fascinating discussion that may be tested in international soccer right now with offside where you have right now you get these if anyone's a watches soccer games how many times do you see where we're looking for is this guy's elbow in front of this guy's shoulder or whatever? And now there's been a recommendation to test that the only way a player is offside is if his body is completely past the the last defender. And I actually think that would be a great change because that would then be a pure... That would be kind of back to more of the spirit of the rule. I think too many times with replay, we... We get we get over the... We, 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 go, we get past the spirit of the rule and we overreact to... Um, like we all know the Matt Duchesne play, he was offsides by 18 feet or whatever it was, right? Like we all know that, but we didn't need to then be taking toenail goals off the, off the board and everything like that. Um, there, I was at the Tampa game last, I was at the Tampa Vegas game last night and there was the replay on the Kucherov empty net goal where, uh, they actually reviewed the high stick, but at the end of the day, they actually couldn't review it. It, it, it was kind of hilarious to me because it should have been it should have been flagged dead right away where it's like, well, that high stick didn't take place in the offensive zone. You can't, it's, it's it just, you can't do that. It shouldn't, we shouldn't have had a lengthy review. It actually forced, it made me to make, take a much more expensive Uber to the airport for my red eye flight because I had to, because that delayed the, because that delayed the end of the game for me. Uh, the it's, I, I instant replay is, I think replay is inherently good as long as you keep, restrictions on it um and that 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 to me is is the big thing um on the gm meetings too i wanted to push off to you i wanted to when you because we always hear about the rule changes and 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 the things like that and some of them are silly but you have to have those conversations some are actually impact the game if you were i'm curious from your perspective if you were to get if you they were to give you five minutes at the podium to walk in and be uh, and, and, and make your case for something. I'm curious what you would spend your time on if you were given the chance to be in that room uh, at one of these meetings in the future. You know, if I'm given five minutes and I want to maximize the likelihood that I get the rule change in that I actually want, the first thing I'm doing is getting rid of the trapezoid. All right, we put the trapezoid in for one goalie, for Martin Brodeur, and right now a lot of goalies, you know, you and I have talked about this offline, are not great puck handlers, but a lot of them think they are better than they actually are. And I would love to create those goalie adventures once again. You know, the goalie, why is that goalie wandering out into the corner? Oh my God, what's he doing over there? And like, you know, so so limiting, you're basically saving the goalie from themselves. And I think hockey is so much more exciting when you have those goalie adventures. I mean, I used to love watching Dominic Hasek just 
wander into the corner and you're like, Dom, you are not that good of a puck, can- puck handler. What are you doing? And it was, you never knew what was going to happen. And I think a lot of that would happen t- in today's NHL too, uh, because a lot of the goalies really are not that strong of puck handlers. And the ones that are, I would love to see that skill come back. You know, we talk about an Igor Shesterkin and his ability to, to, you know, send a breakout pass. Don't limit the guy. If you've got that ability back there, that's another thing that goalies have to be able to do. And so that's the first thing I'm going to say. I'm going to say, look, general managers, Martin Brodeur, he's not in the league anymore. He He's retired. There is now no bona fide puck handler that is exponentially better than everybody else that completely changes the way the game is played. You've also addressed the rules that were also problematic, such as the two-line pass, that was, you know, let, allowing New Jersey to play that way with Brodeur, that's gone. And so now let's see it. Let's see if a goalie wants to, uh, you know, come out of the net, play the puck, and, and kind of change uh, change things up. I think it would end up resulting in more scoring. Uh, but I, I don't know that I could quantify that totally. So that would be my rule change. What about you, Sean? Yeah, I, I would definitely be there giving, like, a I would co-sign your, your presentation. I definitely agree with you on that. Um I would ask the GMs to in the competition committee to look and and I don't know the right answer on this, but we in USA hockey now we have the rule at the youth hockey levels where you can now you can no longer ice the puck when you're on the penalty kill. And that is now a rule in USA hockey for for you so you you've got a generation of kids now within the next five, ten years who will reach the NHL through USA hockey who have learned on the penalty kill they have to make plays. And it seems kind of counterintuitive to me too we're now working on instilling this skill at the development level of usa hockey where you have to make plays you can't just ice the puck and get away with it to all of a sudden you reach the highest level of hockey and now you have the get out of jail free card to ice the puck when you're on the penalty kill so i I would like someone this is one of those where i mentioned the ahl testing things out this is one of those i would love to see tested in the ahl or maybe the echl or something like that i'd love to see the impact on the whistles and how many coaches decide, okay, you know what? We'll still just ice it because we got, we're that good at face-offs or, or, or whatever. Like to me, I would be, I would, my presentation would not be, you must do this, but it would be, Hey, we've seen USA hockey go on down this path with younger players and kids and, and at the youth level. Um, for example, USA hockey nationals for ages are starting this week um, all around the country. And if you go to any of those games, you'll see a team's on the penalty kill. They have to make plays. They have either that or they're going to, or they're going to be punished with faceoffs in their, in their, in their defensive zone. It does lead to more whistles. I admit that. So I don't know the pros and cons that I would like someone at a pro hockey level to test this out for me. And I would like to get an idea of whether, this is good or bad for the game. Is it good to have the the will there be ten more whistles per game if you allow it in an NHL game, or will there be just two? Because that I, I don't know what that number is, but that would be my case. So if USA Hockey's been willing to do this, let's see what it would look like at the pro level, because I think it would increase more offense. And I think as long as it isn't adding too many more whistles to the game, um, I, I think it could be for good, but I would, my key would be, I would be coming up. I'd be saying, please explore this and test this at the AHL level so I can see what it would look like with actual professional. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a fascinating one. And that's one where definitely I, I would need to see some data on what the whistles look like, because for me personally, as I sit and think about it, I'm as a penalty killer, fine. Give me all ice the puck. <laughs> like I'll take another face off. And so you know, if I'm thinking about it, that I don't know that that's a deterrent, but that's where we need to see the data and we need to get some uh, some numbers out there. And so we need a league uh, to, to be willing to pick up the mantle and, and, and give it a shot so that we can evaluate it and analyze it and, you know, ultimately figure things out in there. Well, and, it, and, it, and the issue is like right now we have what we have for kids hockey and USA hockey and stuff like that. To me, that's anecdotal. It's not it's not verifiable enough data where I can go and like I can look at it and be like, oh, I could ask a youth hockey coach of how how many and maybe maybe the system would be to go to USA Hockey and say, oh, how much longer are games happening at your national championships now after with with this rule change? But in general, it's so 
it's just feeling and anecdotal because I because it's not like we have these data sets for what's happening in, in below eight, eighteen hockey un, under eighteen hockey and everything like that. So, um, I, I it's the date. This is one of those where we're, you and I are effectively calling for data. I'd love to see, um, just even like if we could get. I mean, back in October, September, when we were talking about the Coyotes and we we volunteered to coach uh, the Coyotes for a couple games and everything like that. This is this is the type of thing where even if you can't find an AHL taker on it, give me one of those preseason games. Like, give me one of those preseason games just to try this, just to see what this does. Because um, I want to know the answer. I I am I am an I am open to either or, but I I just I want to. I don't know how to be be able to better evaluate it myself without getting some data on this. This is what we need, folks. We need data to be able to analyze it, and then we need analy- analysts to be able to take that data. And so as a part of our big return you know, for Expected by Whom, we decided to bring on John Matisse, a senior NHL writer for The Score, uh, who recently penned a terrific piece uh, kind of revisiting the quote-unquote summer of analytics from 2012 that saw a number of high-profile public analysts get hired by initial teams. And ultimately, over the last decade, we've seen that analytics boom sort of gravitate throughout NHL organizations, uh, down into how coaches use it, how players use it, and how the league has used it. And so without further ado, we'll go over to, to the interview with John now. All right, folks, we are back with Expected by Whom, uh, joined by Sean Shapiro, and this time to re- join us for the return is John Matisse, senior initial writer for The Score. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, guys. Uh, appreciate you having me on. This is uh, the story I just wrote was probably right up your guys' alley, so happy to dissect it or whatever else we get up to here. Well, yeah, you know, as soon as we're kicking around that we're ready to come back, uh, you decide to drop a story about 10 years on the, or 10 years since the summer of analytics. It's almost enticing us to come back and then record on this, right? Well, and you had one of the first reactions on Twitter to the story. And I think you summed it up really well where you said, listen, this is really long, but it's worth the read. And that's, that was my intention, not, to necessarily make it long, but it ended up being long. But my hope was that it was digestible and people weren't going to tune it out because as you guys know, attention spans, you know, just people unable to concentrate for long periods of time. So I was like really on my editor with like, Hey, if we need to cut anything, it's fine. Cause it's 4,000 words. But you know, he told me like the, he just kept reading it, kept reading. It was interested throughout. So, you know, my editor has been in the industry for whatever, 30 years. So he, he can check out pretty easily when he's not interested um, and can be honest about that. So it, it worked out well from that perspective. And I'll, I'll be honest, guys, like it's probably top five um, as far as stories I've written and the feedback I've gotten, whether that's just, you know, what fans think of it, what other media people think of it, or the people I wrote about or the subject I wrote about, the people in and around it hearing from them unsolicited. I got a lot of unsolicited emails and messages from people who work in the league that were like, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there I didn't even know about, or, Hey, you hit the nail on the head with this or, and this isn't to like brag or anything, but just to give you perspective on like, for whatever reason, this story resonated with people. Um, so yeah, I was, I was pretty happy with it, but it was certainly like, uh, one of those things where it's such a big topic and you guys deal with this all the time with, with this podcast. It's, there's so many different directions you can go and you wonder about translating stuff to the casual fan. And if you're, um, you know, talking about things that maybe they just don't understand or haven't heard about, and then you got to do some sort of explaining. And then, so there's a bit of a, um, a finesse angle to it as well in terms of trying to hit that, uh, that big funnel of people. With, uh, one of the things that I always find interesting when we do this stuff, John is like, there's times where we come in and we have our thesis or like our idea of what we're working on. And then there's what we actually learn and, and write as we go along. Like what was for the, this story, the one, the 4,000 word piece that we've read and Prashanth was much kinder telling people it's long. I think my tweet was just read this. Mine was very, <laughs> I was a little bit more blunt in that, but for you, as you kind of, from, did you write the story you expected to write or did it kind of evolve as you kind of started diving into, Hey, I want to, I want to write about this, the summer of analytics. 
Yeah, I would say my initial idea was actually to do a series, so multiple articles, one, two, three, four, five, whatever it ended up being. But I realized early on that I could use Eric Tolsky as sort of the quote unquote main character of the story and go through the last ten years um and relate it to his life and his evolution and rise through the ranks of of, of the Hurricanes organization. And and you know, at the same time kind of zoom out and do something on the entire league on hockey in general. And I would say um, it became a matter of zeroing in on certain aspects of this. Like there's a bunch of stuff that didn't make the cut for the story. Um, For example, I didn't touch on the Florida Panthers who are the one team that you could argue went all in, went all money puck, all money ball on, you know, whatever that was six, seven years ago. And it just didn't kind of fit into the narrative because it would have been a whole rabbit hole of, hey, sometimes this stuff doesn't work. Or if you go too hard in one way, it's probably not going to work out. Or if you don't stick to the plan for multiple years, it's not going to work out. So I I steered away from that. Um, I would say a big, uh, not revelation necessarily, but one thing I really learned while reporting it is that... Really, the the quote unquote data people, the people from the outside, ten years ago, who are now entrenched in the league, over ten years. I mean, ten years is a long time, right? Like they've become quote unquote hockey people. They're still non traditional, but like they've met those traditional people in the middle on a lot of these, um, these questions and a lot of these insights and a lot of this analysis around the game. So if you're from the outside and you're so in the weeds with the stats, and then you come to an organization and you start talking to scouts, you start talking to coaches and you go, they're actually smarter than I thought. Or like they, they think on the same wavelength as me. It's just, they're using the eye test and not the stats. And then you have all these great conversations and you understand that things are more nuanced on the inside. You're dealing with personalities in the dressing room. You're dealing with coaches who want to play a certain way. Or you're dealing with GMs that are trying to save their job by making whatever acquisition that doesn't make sense. So there's that aspect. And then there's the traditional hockey people really coming around as far as maybe in 2014, a lot of coaches had their back up and went, oh, wait, is analytics going to take my job? Is it going to, you know, this new scary thing is is just, I don't know what to think about it. Now they're like, yeah, it's been around for 10 years and the data's gotten better. And I like working with this director of hockey analytics and... You know, it makes my job easier, makes the video coach's job easier. So I would say that was a big takeaway was that this whole like war between the old school and new school is roughly eliminated. I mean, obviously, there's some people who are still entrenched in their lane. But like I said, 10 years is a long time. It's also a short time. You know, there's still a lot, a lot to go here. There's still another part of this evolution. But if you sort of compare 2014 to 2024, it's pretty substantial as far as how far things have come. Yeah. I think there's one thing I definitely want to highlight of what you said was the, how far analytics folks or folks that have that kind of background have come to meet the NHL kind of people, if you will, uh, in the middle. And I think that's been a prevailing theme that we've heard from everybody that we've had on the show, just, understanding how intelligent these hockey people really are. And I'm using hockey people not to uh, be like derogatory in any sense, but just to state that these are people that are coming from the the background of the sport and understanding how intelligent they are, how much they understand the different details, and then seeing that evolution of those analytics folks um, that have come out of, whether it's the public space or the private space, and then going into you know, working with those organizations and then getting the chance to hear from them. It's absolutely incredible to see, again, what everybody tries to say is that there's not, it's not black and white. There is a gray and everybody's got to kind of come back to the middle. And so one of the things I wanted to, you know, get your perspective on is as a part of this story, you talk to uh, the analytics staffers for NHL teams. You talk to public analytics experts like Corey, uh, you've talked to players, you talk to people in the league, you talk to people in the front office, you talk to coaches. What is sort of your sense on the on what the current impact of analytics is across the league, whether it's across coaching, front office, or even down to the how players are using it? Where do you think you know things are sort of positioned right now? Yeah, there's a lot of ways to take that. Uh, first, I'll go with 
this insight. I, you know, I did some research on how many people are working in data related roles, and it's roughly gone from, you know, 15, one, five, you know, before this big hiring spree in 2014, when you saw Eric Tolsky, Tim Barnes, Tyler Dello, those sort of thought leaders leave the space in the public and go behind closed doors. So there was a roughly 15 before those guys went. And then now there's 150, roughly. Um, that's pretty phenomenal, a 10x over 10 years. Um, and each, as far as like the sort of um, the trend, you know, 22 of 32 teams employ two to five people. So that gives you a, you know, a kind of a feel for like, okay, how much of an investment is this? And one thing that really jumped off the page for me as far as my reporting was two teams that I focused on, two teams that were willing to talk on the record about it, the Vegas Golden Knights, they have one, technically they have one analytics staffer. Their director of hockey operations, uh, the former uh, operator of general manager, Tom, I cannot say his last name, Paraska or something, <laughs> him and Dustin Walsh, their director of hockey analytics, they work directly with with Bruce Cassidy. They get along great. They There's a really good relationship there. So that's, that's one and a half people, let's say. Um, but it has a huge impact. And the same goes for the Minnesota Wild. Matt Sells is in on every conversation with Bill Guerin, with the coaching staff. Like he's just part, like we, he's part of the inner circle. And that's, that's really kind of a, a way to frame this is 10 years ago, these analytics folks were not on the inside as far as, okay, they might be a hockey analyst. They might have an entry level job with these teams, but and they might be, you know, valued to some extent, but they weren't in the room for the big decisions. And now they are. Like Matt Sells is is a day to day check in for all the decision makers in Minnesota. So I thought that was um, pretty enlightening as far as you know. Teams like Chicago, they have eleven people working in data roles. Um, teams like um, I believe uh, Pittsburgh has nine. You know, you've got Toronto and, and New Jersey really high up there as well. Obviously, they're invested. I mean, it's pretty obvious. But then there's teams that have one, two, three, four people that are also, you know, they're leaning on these people heavily and and they're in VP roles or maybe they're a director of hockey analytics, but they're really, you know, counted on. That was big. And then also I found it pretty interesting that that coaches are starting to weave data into their coaching, their teaching, their pre-scouts uh, more than ever before. I think it's pretty obvious the utility there as far as pre-scouting as a coaching staff. So, hey, sitting down, watching video, getting your analytics person to say, hey, this team is top five in, in four check chances. They're going to be on us tonight. Something as simple as that, going through puck retrievals, whatever the case may be, using the data to inform your your sort of your pre-scout. Your, um, but to take that, to take those insights and deliver it to players in a very – um, common man way or layman way, I think has been a pretty big development as far as, okay, the coaching staff knows these five things about this team that they're about to play based on, you know, the data, five data points, we'll call it. They're probably going to deliver one of those data points to the team. They don't want to overload these players. And also it's almost not necessary to, to have a, a specific data point. It's more, okay, if they're going to be hard on the four check, well, we've got to be good on retrievals. We got to maybe you know, just expect that a little bit more. That's maybe not the greatest, you know, example, but you guys get it where it's like their offense is this way. So we're going to play our defense this way. And the way that you deliver that message is informed by data, but perhaps you're not even including a number in that message. So I found that interesting as far as it seemed like most teams across the league are incorporating data into their pre-scout. And then, you know, the trickle down of that is that, they're making decisions with their players or with their coaching that is being informed by data. It's it's fitting that you just mentioned Vegas because I was I was there earlier this week doing something for my role with the EP rink side and on Monday Bruce Cassidy was talking about the game against the Devils and he talked about kind of how that game he looked at their defensive structure and he brought up hey analytically and the eye test it looked good and. He was actually someone who I, I asked the follow-up question of, like, what do you look at analytically? And he actually gave a pretty good answer. He was someone who actually, when when a coach is able then to go and say, well, I look at how the slot chances came out, I look at how the rush chances came out, and I, I take a look at that and kind of compare that to what I see as well. 
when he can communicate that to us, you can tell there it's definitely something that is part of their everyday routine. The coaching perspective is, is fascinating. But the one I wanted to go down is because the part to me that I loved about this story, there's a lot of parts I loved about the story, John, but the the Travis Konechny anecdote about how he essentially, they, they kind of, t- with working with Danny Briere and with, um, I want to make sure I have everyone, get everyone proper credit, who was there? Uh, Ian Anderson. Uh, Ian Anderson, to kind of effectively improve his game looking at data. And yes, I had a really good conversation with Robert Thomas, I see in this story. When you were building this story out and you're talking to players, you obviously have some good examples of how guys are using it. What was your kind of reception as you were reporting this out, talking to players about the usage as the, the we, we see the Konechny story, we see the Robert Thomas responses, but how many times did you get guys being like, I have no idea what that is? Or like, like what was kind of your response when you were talking to players about this across the board? Well, I'll be honest, since I wasn't sure how players would react to this topic, I targeted two guys that I thought might be interested in the data, might be inquisitive. Like Robert Thomas, he's such a cerebral player. Like it seems like he would probably be the type. Um, so at the All-Star game, I already had a one-on-one setup with Travis Konechny, just like kind of in general. And so I'm like, okay, you know, I'm not going to, it's way easier to, to ask this nuanced question that requires a bunch of follow-ups off to the side versus at the podium where a bunch of other people are around and he might kind of uh, clam up. So I just, you know, threw it out there to connect me. Hey, uh, you know, have you ever in your career, like you've kind of grown up in this analytics era, have you ever dug into the numbers or has a, you know, a skills coach in the summer even, you know, sat you down and, and went through things or or wasn't an assistant coach? And he goes, yeah, like a couple of years ago, I was struggling and, you know, Danny Briere came to me and said, and at this time, Danny Briere is a special assistant to the GM. So he was like kind of influential but he wasn't quite the gm and danny basically said listen i've been talking to our analytics staff and there's a lot of data and we can pair it with video that suggests that you are just not getting to the dangerous areas of the ice like you used to um and so you know part of this is sort of like appealing to authority for connecting because he goes this guy's a legend in this this organization. He's a smart guy. Like, who doesn't respect Danny Briere? So we kind of, like, I think that helped in terms of convincing him to sit down. You got to kind of swallow your ego because they're kind of doing a special project on him, right? It's not like an assistant coach who is going, ah, you know, you're struggling in this area. Let's talk about it. It's this person outside of the coaching staff saying we've been really digging into things here. So anyway, long story short, Konechny connects with Briere and Ian Anderson, the director of hockey o- uh, hockey analytics with the flyers and they go over just what what the data says as far as how he's playing in the offensive zone and it starts to be sort of a 10 game segment conversation and he said even in the summer he was getting like emails to he was getting packages sent to his email um so you know it, it requires a certain buy-in and the main message that they were trying to relay was you know he was shooting from the outside I think there was, I, I didn't include it, but there was some crazy stat where I think it was in 21, 22 out of all, and I'm going to mess up the numbers, but I'm trying to just illustrate the point of all the players to have, I don't know, 300 shots on goal. He was like second last from the bottom in terms of shooting percentage. Like that's a, that's a red flag. Like this guy's a skilled player. He's not, you know, some defenseman or some, you know, grinder on the third line. So stuff like that said, you got to get to the interior and, and, and he, and it requires a rewiring of, of the brain. Right. So it didn't happen overnight, but he slowly started to not only as a shooter, but as a playmaker, uh, find, find his way into the interior and just attack the net a little bit more and get away from the, I guess the shot volume type of style. And, you know, he saw the results. So that's obviously a huge part of it too, is if you're working with a Danny Briere and Ian Anderson, is there is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Is there is there is there greener pasture there? Um, and that ended up being the case with Konechny. Uh, and and I think it was a bit of a perfect storm, as far as him being so low on himself at that point and really struggling. And here's a lifeline. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless. And uh, Sean, to kind of circle back to your original question, I happened to just talk to the first two guys I talked to gave me such good anecdotes that I didn't even need to really go down the road of talking to a bunch of players 
about how they've uh, interacted with the dad over the years because Robert Thomas was open about it. So was Travis Connecting. They were both at the All Star game. Um, and I could have kind of poked around with other players, but I thought given I was talking about 20 people to about 20 people for the piece and a lot of it was non player related, I thought I was, I was in good shape. So, um, you know, I'd love to tell you a story about a player, you know, just ripping analytics uh, off the record to me, but that just, that just didn't happen. And Hey, it's one of those things where, um, there's, and I'm sure you guys have talked about this on the show, but there's, there's like this there's this real like negative connotation with the word analytics, right? Like if you say advanced stats to a player or data, they might be a little more, you know, receptive to that. But when you throw out the word analytics, it kind of makes them cringe or, you know, it's just, there's something about that word going back to 2014 and earlier where there was so much fighting online about, you know, the value of advanced stats and stuff. And this is a whole sports analytics thing as a whole. It's not just hockey, but when you get away from that word, I think it really helps. It's funny when you say that because I was I've randomly noticed this in my own writing sometimes. I have intentionally gone out of the way right now instead of using the word coursey sometimes, and I'll refer to it, but I will use the word shot share. Just because for whatever reason, like you'll get people you use coursey all of a sudden someone will be like, Oh, you're using those numbers and it's like but then all of a sudden you say, Oh, well they have this percentage of shot share. Oh, that's great. And you're like, This is the exact same <laughs> the exact same same thing. <laughs> You know, so, so John, along those lines, a lot of the challenges with adoption of analytics, both within NHL organizations and really, you know, fans, uh, I, I think it's been related to messaging and communication. And so one of the areas that um, your story didn't explore, but I'm curious to get your take on is how the NHL broadcast has changed. Um, you know, we've seen Certain uh, teams uh, with their regional broadcast, like, you know, in particular, we're blessed in Detroit to have seen kind of Ken Daniels and Mickey Redmond start to incorporate a lot more of their sport logic stats, you know, on the Bally Sports broadcast. We've seen Root Sports out in Seattle kind of bringing Allison Lucan to do a lot more there. And even on some of the, the national broadcasts in Canada, you've seen, you know, Mike Kelly gets a little bit uh, of a bigger role. Uh, so I'm curious, you know. Did you have a chance to explore kind of how broadcast analytics has has evolved in this space, or or if not, kind of what are your thoughts on that? Just just kind of a, as a whole. Yeah, I'd say I mostly touched on it in my conversation with Mike Kelly. You mentioned he works for NHL Network and as well as Sport Logic, one of those third party providers of the data. And I think he's, if not the best in this space, uh, one of the best as far as you know, making uh, data more sticky, more relatable to the common fan. And one thing he said to me was better information ultimately leads to better analysis. And he was talking about teams, but you know, you can relate that to broadcast too. And, you know, he kind of mentioned it was still annoying him a little bit. How say in between periods, they'll put broadcast will put up, you know, Obviously, you're going to put goals, you know, maybe you put shots. Okay, that makes sense. But then it'll be like penalty minutes and uh, blocks and hits and face-offs. And it's like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, how are these all, like, these aren't really indicative of, of the play. Like, unless there's some huge disparity or something, or or some team had these, um, you know, some kind of uh, amazing run of block shots, and that's the story of the game. But for that to be the default, it, it just tells you, like, a lot of this stuff is only out there because it's just it's what's always been done if you ask the broadcaster hey why do you have face off so prominently in your in your on your show it would be well i don't know we've always done that or well to be fair like face offs the one thing about face offs that it, they're easy to analyze because they're sort of the base they're the one baseball type event in hockey where you have a stoppage and everyone's waiting for the, the game to start and there can be some sort of tactics that you can pull from that but Nevertheless, I think, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my conversation with, with Mike Kelly. He mentioned one thing that he'd like to see broadcasters do a little bit more, and, and he was kind of just blue skying this, was say a penalty's been called uh, and, and the Capitals are about to go on the power play. You have, you know, 10, 15 seconds there to show a, like uh, an overhead sort of graphic on the offensive zone where you can show where the team takes its shots from. So obviously in this instance... 
the OV spot is going to be, you know, a huge blob of red. Stuff like that where it's like this is so easy to just instead of the commentator, you know, rambling on about who knows what, you just, you know, you have this set up beforehand and you just automatically go to that great visual. And I, you know, at the same time, I think that hockey analysis, both say online and on broadcast has gotten a lot better. Um, I think, you know, places or, or organizations like sport logic and staff leads and clear site analytics, like they've been huge as far as just making stuff more translatable, making, you know, I quantifying things that show up on a broadcast all the time, like just to, you know, use sport logic as an sport logic as an example, the fact that they categorize their scoring chances into, you know, four check cycle rush, um, you know, deflection and whatnot, like that alone, you can do a lot with that data um, in game or, you know, maybe an intermission. So there's a, there's a lot, to, a lot of room to grow on that front as far as broadcast, but some, some home broadcasts are doing it better than others. Some national broadcasts are doing it better than the other than others. And I think what it comes down to is like, as long as it's, you can kind of see it on the video. Like if you can marry the video that you know, say, say you're showing a replay, if you can directly say like, this is a cycle chance and you show this and then show that the team is first in cycle chance. And that's how they win hockey games. Like, I think that's just so intuitive. And if you're just some guy that tunes into the games and does nothing else for your fandom, you know, you're a Leafs fan and every, you watch it all 82 Leaf games, but like you don't read anything else. You don't engage in any other media. Like, this is your time to really get educated. And I think that's so simple. You don't need to have a math degree to sort of see that connection between the data and the video and the analysis from, I don't know, Mike Johnson or a Ray Ferraro or a Mike Kelly if it's a, if it's a studio uh, segment. So, yeah, it's come it's it's kind of similar to this evolution of what's going on in front offices. I feel like it's come a long way, the broadcast, but there's still – Areas where you go, ah, you could do that a lot better. It, it's funny because when you were talking earlier, you talked about kind of how the war, for lack of a better word, is over within NHL teams. Where the the analytics staff, everything like that, these are now collaborative efforts. It's if you look, if you were to only look at media coverage, though, you would sometimes think the war isn't over because you get sometimes people will go and overly defend well this is why you can't use xg or this is why you can't use this or, or whatever and and this is why you have to only use your eyes and it seems that as you kind of touched on there as it's internally it's teams have realized this from a media perspective and we and prashant was talking about broadcast but i think it's from a writing perspective too that's fascinating to watch where i think there's still i think part of the fan old school, they don't use the numbers narrative is also part of the spot where teams, we, it's not well covered that teams do this. And I think it's kind of, and I'm curious of your thoughts on this, John, because I think it comes from two things. I think it's one, I think it's, there's hockey writers, it's not our fault because teams aren't willing to share this. I think that's one of the reasons too. I think there's kind of a, there's, there's part of this where the story you wrote, obviously you got great buy-in. There's a lot of times you'll go talk to a team and they'll be like, mm, that's, that's confidential. We don't, we don't, we don't talk about that. So we don't know what they actually do. Right. And then there's, and then there's also something for where we still have places to grow as media members to be able to best actually do this. So I was curious, kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah. On the, the buy-in from, players, coaches, front office people, et cetera. You know, there were some teams that denied my interview requests. Like, it's not like this was a thing where with the players, it just happened to work out where the first two guys I talked to worked out. Um, like Bruce Cassidy, who became kind of the star of the story, for lack of a way to put it. Um, he was like the 18th person that I talked to out of 20. So he kind of made the story in the end. But, like, it, it takes, you know, some, some I guess, persistence in that sense. And, you know just to give you some behind the scenes, I mean, I, I, I went down to Buffalo, um, and I text the PR guy before, uh, Cassidy was off the ice and said, Hey, you know, I have a topic that's not really great for a scrum. Like it'll require some follow-ups and it's just kind of just awkward to talk to talk about on camera. Can I talk to Bruce off to the side for five minutes about, you know, how he uses data these days. And so like, you know, my expectations are fairly low and I wasn't even sure if I was going to get them, but then I get them. And I turn on my recorder and ask, you know, a simple question. And he basically talked for 10 minutes straight and completely, you know, filled my recorder with good stuff. And 
Yeah, he's he's a bit of an exception across the league in general, right? As you mentioned, Sean, Bruce Cassidy's very open. He was open in uh, in in Boston as well, and he it, it seems like I don't know if this is you know actually conscious from from his perspective, but he seems to take a ambassador role as a coach to some perspective where he feels like you know when he's talking to the media, he's also talking to fans and he's talking to other coaches, and he's a leader now, especially now that he's won a cup. Um, so. There's that angle, and I just think in general it's it's one of those things where the further you get away from the toxicity that was there in the early 2010s as far as, you know, Corsi versus plus minus or, you know, the fact that people would value penalty minutes when it's clearly a negative to have a penalty. Um, it's just silly stuff like that, like really basic stuff, but that people were really up in arms about on the traditional side – because they just didn't under they didn't understand what this was all about and who these people were that were coming up with these new insights and you know again there's some some insecurity there um, as far as you know are, are, are our jobs in jeopardy like let's say the old school columnist to, to bring it back to media did they feel like they were going to be left behind as they're you know 55 and they're riding off into the sunset in the next 10 years are they going to make it to the end of that road because they're all of a sudden out of touch so that the the way that they react to that is by with backlash some column about how analytics is the worst thing in the world and one of the main talking points back then and it's still relevant to some extent now is hockey is such a chaotic chaotic sport it's such a fast free-flowing sport and it's only gotten faster and more skilled over the last 10 years and i i totally buy into that where this isn't baseball we've seen how baseball's gone so deeply into the numbers that it's actually become maybe to a negative um I mean, hockey's in a bit of a sweet spot now where there's an acknowledgement that you can't quantify everything. There's an acknowledgement that this is, you know, five five players versus five players who are on an, an ice surface. They have knives under their boots. They're, there's a puck bobbling around. They're using sticks. Like, there's, there's so much chaos that it's very difficult to just, you know, close your eyes and, and trust the numbers. So I think that's very much part of the conversation internally with teams. Where, yes, this data is helpful, but like sometimes a goalie gets hot, or yes, this data is helpful, or sometimes the puck goes off, you know, the the defenseman shin pad in the net. Um, so that's always going to be there, and I think that's what makes hockey great. Um, but yeah, that's that's that relates to all facets of this is is the nature of of hockey, and I just think that the the data has been around long enough now that even that the quote unquote haters. Um, will you know ref the reference shot attempt differential? It's just so simple, right? Like if it's it, like it's it sounds so silly now that there were even there was even a discussion about the value of Corsi and 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 you know it, Bruce Gassi actually put it a good, in a good way to me with the way he views Corsi and and expected goals is it's a nice snapshot of the game and that's you know you don't have to go any further than that as far as you know team a team's game by game performance. So if his team loses four, three, but the expected goals are actually, you know, six, three in, in the favor of Vegas, that gives him a little, you know, lets him sleep at night a little bit better. And he's still going to go through the video. He's still going to talk to his coaches to break things down. He's still going to, you know, stress over the little things, but like, at least he feels like his team, you know, they were in the fight. And whereas 20 years ago, he didn't have access to that. Um, so that's another component of it where it's just adding a little more nuance to sort of the day to day discussion. You know, John, I think that that tees up, you know, kind of our last question for you um, perfectly. So, you know, relative to other leagues, we still haven't seen a atypical general manager. And by atypical, I'm meaning someone coming in from a purely analytics background. You know, 22 out of the 32 NHL GMs had a pro career. Like, that's very different compared to where the NFL is now where the NBA is now and where, where obviously Major League Baseball is now. So sort of at, in, in your crystal ball here, looking ahead, you know, do you see hockey going down that path similar to other sports, given kind of the entrenchment of analytics within different front offices? And do you think it'll necessarily hit that same degree uh, of, of kind of entrenchment all the way up to that general manager level um, that we've seen in other sports? Yeah, I think there's a real interesting uh future in this space where 
so many teams have presidents of hockey ops now. And so, like, let, let's just think of Philly, for example. Keith Jones, I mean, he's basically, like, a spokesperson. Obviously, he's involved in decision-making, but, like, Breer is on the phone with GMs. Like, Keith Jones is the guy who does the interview with the, the local TV station or whatever. I think that approach of having that tiered system of having the spokesperson president and having a GM, and Danny Breer is not a great example just because he's an ex-player, but of having a GM that's, like, in the thick of things and maybe not speaking as much publicly and just kind of grinding away, I think that model makes sense and is also not only the present but the future. And why that relates to what you're talking about is that, say if you take a guy like Eric Tulski, I think that one day he will be a GM. He's interviewed for Pittsburgh and Chicago jobs, and I wasn't able to nail it down, but I would assume he's going to be at least considered for the Columbus job, which... Uh, the president, John Davidson, even mentions in his uh, kind of requirements for the job that you have to have a good handle on analytics. So um, he certainly uh, qualifies in, from that perspective. And I just think as these guys, you know, to use Tulski as an example, as they move along in their career, they're going to continue to gain traction and build up a reputation. And an interesting thing that Tulski told me was that I didn't really you know, realize was so he's coming from the tech world, the science world where he was working for these massive companies or in some cases, massive companies where he had executive training, you know, this really high level training and how to be a good manager. Like, and he really, he really thinks deeply about like how he manages his staff. Like, it's not just, I'm a hockey guy and I happen to be an assistant GM because I've, you know, I have this playing career and I have things to say now it's no, he's like a manager slash data guy um, as far as his skill set. So, I think that'll take some of these people far um, as far as having that that little edge from like the, I don't know if it's people skills perspective because, you know, the you can have people skills in many different ways, but it's almost like the resume is different than the, the, the traditional person. So, yeah, I mean, I can see, I don't know if it's Tolski, I don't know if it's Tyler Dello with someone else. I can see a, an analytics person standing at a podium, you know, at somewhat sometime soon. Um, as the GM and and I'll, I'll sort of differentiate between those types of folks and Kyle Dubas and Kyle or John Chaka in that. And I mentioned this in the piece, like Kyle Dubas is, is, is kind of misrepresented or miss uh, um, like his, you know, his, his identity or reputation publicly isn't quite aligned with his past. Like he was a stick boy for the Sioux Greyhounds as a kid, his dad or his uh, grandpa was a coach of that team. He was a scout at a really young age. He was a, an agent at a really young age. Like he was a true and true hockey person. He just happened to kind of cling on to the analytics movement and rode that wave. So he's, although he's into stats, he's also kind of very much a traditional person. So he doesn't really count John Chaka. You could argue kind of, you know, counts more than, than Dubas, but still, you know, he was, a, he almost made the OHL. Like he was a really good hockey player. And, you know, the first thing he did out of school was try to get into video analysis that wasn't so data related and also fitness. Like he was in the gym with players. So he's, again, more of a hockey guy than a Tulski who started blogging randomly at like age 35 and was in a completely different industry, had no institutional ties to hockey and now he's really made some inroads uh not only before he came into the um the hurricanes front office but since he's he's joined full time over the last 10 years so i find that pretty interesting where whether it's Tolski or some of his other peers like th these sort of true we'll call them true stats people um are really making an impression and starting to move up and i think it's just an inevitability that one of them will become like a an actual uh you know full-fledged gm who has serious uh, decision making power I love it. Well, uh, John, I don't want to steal too much more of your time. So we just want to thank you for, for taking the time to join us, help us usher back in expected by whom. And, uh, we'll definitely point everyone to, to go check out John's piece and other work, obviously, uh, over at the score and, and, and make sure you keep up to date with everything that John's working on. Cause that's uh, honestly one of the best articles I've read in the last couple of years. I'll just say that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, it was one. Of, it was kind of the bane of my existence for a while there. <laughs> I was, you know, putting it off, and then you know, I talked to all these people, and it's like, how do I structure this thing? And then you got to sit down and write it. Once I got into the writing, I was like, okay, I think I have something here. So it all sort of paid off the, from that perspective. But guys, thanks for having me on and uh, have me uh, have the floor here to ramble and talk about my process and everything. I appreciate that. Yeah, everyone, go read it. It's a great story. Go read it. <laughs>
Wonderful. Well, that is John Matisse, uh, senior NHL writer for The Score. John, thank you so much again, and I look forward to hopefully having you on sometime down the road. Thanks again, guys. All right, folks, that was uh, John Matisse of The Score, senior NHL writer there. Again, continue to check out John's work. Uh, He's done a tremendous job over the years and been a great friend of uh, Sean and mine's. uh, so really appreciate him taking the time to come on. But we want to shift gears to a totally different topic and one that was really exciting Uh, I know, Sean, you got a chance to actually cover this, um, but the PWHL actually doing a couple of games outside of uh, their team cities, with one of those being in Detroit following the Red Wings game uh, this past weekend. And so, Sean, can you give us a little kind of insight into, uh, you know, what it was like being able to cover that type of game and what you sort of what you were able to garner from the reception that the Detroit fans gave that PWHL game. Yeah, so, I mean, I, the actual PWHL game I didn't cover. I went to the actual PWHL game. What I did was I have a uh, I have a five-year-old daughter who is starting to play hockey, and one of the things that has been um, – one of, one of the things that's kind of been her one frustration with learning to play has been she says, Dad, I have to dress like – the boy because she's smart she sees she knows what i do for a living i watch a lot of hockey on tv and it's it's always boys on it's 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 never girls hockey and so um so i did not cover the game in a quote-unquote media capacity Uh, officially it was more important for me from a perspective of I, i bought tickets um, took my daughter, took my son, my wife came to and took my, took my five-year-old and she had one of the, she had a blast. It was, she told me the most fun she's had at a hockey game. Um, it was a really good game too. Like, um, sometimes we get in all sports, in, in all sports, right? Like the build up to an event can be great, but sometimes the game can suck and it's, and if you can still have fun. I think you can still have a good time at a bad event, but you need the game itself to be great, to have a great time. Um, and it was a great game. It was Boston. Uh, Boston won two to one in the shootout. Um, my my daughter was heavily rooting for the the Boston goalie Aaron Frankel by the end of by the end of, by the end of the game and and in, in the shootout and everything like that. So uh, I may have uh, dug my own grave on something in that in that relation, which I can't really uh, which would be which would be uh, karma, cosmic karma for what I did to my own parents as a as a goaltender. Um, but it was, uh, but I did cover, I went to, I spent, I covered all the other events around leading up to it. I was at the media availability on Tuesday. Uh, I was at the practice on, uh, I was at practice on Friday. I swung by the Ottawa morning skate as well. And, uh, I've spoke to a bunch of people from the PWHL. I, I'm far from a quote unquote PWHL insider. There's Haley Salvian's a great person for that. There's some other great people over at the ice garden who do a great job. Please give them, them all of a read. Um, but this is one of the worst kept secrets is PWHL is going to expand at some point. Year one is six teams. Um, next year, I believe, is still only going to be six. And at some point, they're going to start filling out that map. It's uh, Obviously, it's uh, very northeastern based right now with Minnesota. And at some point, they're going to fill out that map probably between Minnesota and Toronto and, and, and Montreal and, and New York and Boston and Ottawa. And... There's a reason that Detroit and Pittsburgh were one of the neutral two of the neutral site games this weekend. This this past weekend, it's they are heavily looking at those markets. Um, Michigan is a as far as a, as far as girls hockey goes, um, it is the fourth largest state as far as girls hockey participation in in, in the United States after Minnesota, Massachusetts, in in New York. So there is a there there is a base and there is an audience. The I think the crowd was great. They had about thirteen. I think it was thirteen thousand three hundred eighty-one. I think um, at the time a, a record for U.S. Uh, an American crowd for a women's hockey game. And uh, he like you're walking around and there's a lot of teams. There's a lot of teams there and everything like that. And uh, I mean to me it's a great data point for the PWHL that Detroit you have this consumer base that will come and support your product. And there was some great chance where the people are chanting Detroit wants a team. And it was, it was kind of funny just Prashanth, just knowing the like natural NHL rivalries where it's Boston versus Ottawa playing in the game. So it's like, 
it's, it, from a from a typical hockey Red Wings Detroit perspective lens to be rooting for either Ottawa or Boston to win was kind of weird, but that's the that's 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 the reality of it. And uh, I I personally like I wrote this afterwards, and I and to, to me. I come from this from a dad perspective where I'd love for this to be something that two, three years from now I can bring my daughter to and, and it can, so she can see that my one worry. And just from a logistical standpoint is I wonder where and how they get it done in Detroit properly. And I think that's the thing we sometimes have to remember. And I don't want to be the bad guy on this because sometimes it can come off as the bad guy, but it's just like when I see someone talks about, that 30 million people watch USA Canada in the women's hockey Olympic gold medal game. That's great. I'm not ripping down that at all. But the fact of the matter is it's a one-off gold medal game between the two best teams in the world. It's easy to get people to tune in. Getting 13,000 people to one game where you're seeing these group sales for all these teams, that's that's it's not easy, but it, it is it's much easier to do it for a one-off. It's a reason it's it's I, I bought four tickets for my family at basically twenty five bucks a piece and for for with with fees or whatever probably like one thirty probably total out the door for for where we sat and that's fine for a one off but I'm not sure and even I say I want to bring my daughter to these things like this in the future I'm not the type of person who's going to be able to go and say oh I'm going to get season tickets and that's going to be so for Detroit to work. And I hope someone smarter than me has already figured out how it would work. You need to find the venue that fits, logistically speaking, and get the commitment of the a season ticket holder base that makes it a viable business. Because I think the worst thing would be like to take the wrong lessons from that. I don't. I hope some from the PWHL looks at that and says, "Oh, they got thirteen thousand people." Please don't look at it and think you can get 10,000 people at a game. Please don't think about that that way. That's, and this is not being, being being cruel. It's just the reality. You have to think about it. How do we create a sustainable business and where do we play? And this is where Detroit kind of starts to run into some problems because there's not really the venues that, that are proper for it, right? Like there's not – this is a whole other can of worms that we could probably talk about at another time too. It's like – uh, the Boston team plays at you plays at the at the ring for UMass Lowell, right? The uh, that they have the other smaller venues around there. They have the um, other places play in, in in minor league venues or other venues, uh, men's minor league venues that that fit the right way. Like um, we don't really have that in Detroit. Like USA Hockey Arena in theory in Plymouth, where the under eighteen and under seventeen national team play, holds three thousand four hundred. It's it's old. It was hastily built. Like this is actually kind of funny. I don't know if people realize this. The reason USA Hockey Arena was was so hastily built was because of an old uh, rift between Red Wings ownership and the in the in the Red Wing the junior Red Wings ownership, and basically it led to uh, why am I drawing a blank on their name? Uh, former for Tom Dundon, who bought the team from. Uh, uh, Carmanos. Carmanos, yeah. Carmanos basically. Peter Carmanos. Yeah. yeah, Peter Carmanos basically swiftly built that building, so he had a place to move his team, and it's it's fine. It's got two suites, and it's but it's you in theory could, but it's it doesn't really have the pro hockey feel to me, and plus you already have two full time tenants there between the U eighteen and U seventeen men uh, men's men's team, so I don't know if that would work. Um, there's the rink in Fraser that is has I think seats around three and three three thousand three th- three and a half thousand, but that's Fraser's not really Detroit either. So um, I hope someone smarter than me has figured it out and looked at where this could work feasibility because I think there is the audience and the base and the market for it from a consumer standpoint. I just worry about the logistics and. That's kind of one of those weird things when we have to look at this because I, you walk out of that game emotionally speaking, and I'm doing it with my five year old daughter thinking like, oh, this is great. I want to see this all the time. I also want to see it done right. And so that's kind of my big takeaways from it. I've rambled a lot. I will let you respond. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think a lot of what you, you raise is valid. I think what I come back to is if you sort of look at the history of, of professional women's hockey, you know, really, really the big challenge has been an in, an inconsistently available product that's not marketed well. And 
what I took away from this series and the way that PWHL has kind of gone in in its first season is there is absolutely a market here. You know, there there's a market for women's hockey. There are people that are very much interested in attending these games, being at these games, you know, doing what they can. And so having exactly what you said, which is kind of a, a focused approach to how they're going to expand, how they're going to continue marketing, getting their games on ESPN was huge. You know, you go from having the games on Twitch to not having the games available via ESPN. That's big. Continuing to find and capitalize on those marketing opportunities, the marketability of their players. They're starting to do that more and more uh, this year and, and really – You know, when you think about how the PWHL has only six teams, there are so many more talented players that are just not currently able to to play on a pro team. And so there's there's also the talent available, you know, for the league to expand. And so as long as it's done thoughtfully, as long as it's done with the the right kind of business approach, uh, which is what's been lacking in any of these leagues really taking off over the last decade – and I'm by no means an expert. I would I would absolutely defer everybody to Mike Murphy and his team over at the Ice Garden. I think they do just a tremendous job, and they're really the true experts in kind of the history and legacy here. But just speaking based on what I've read from him and his team, you know, I, I really think that there is a there is a big opportunity here. There is an opportunity that needs to be capitalized on. But as you said, it needs to be done smartly. It needs to be done with the right business sense, and it needs to be done, you know, in all likelihood. Um, probably a little slower than fans would want um, to be to be truthful to that. And I think we've seen that. If anybody read Max Boltman's article uh, in The Athletic covering, um, you know, the, the, the PWHL game, and he had a chance to, to speak with, um, you know, some folks from the PWHL there, uh, they, they sort of are cautiously optimistic on what they learned from this weekend neutral site series and what it means for expansion, what it means for the ability to grow the game. I think they've got all the potential in the world, um, and I'm excited to see what they do with it. And I think they are going to need to con- have continued support from NHL teams. I think they're going to need to have continued access uh, you know, to these types of events, and it's going to allow for them to have a, a much more successful launch and hopefully – this can finally be the one unified professional women's league that, you know, addresses and gets, you know, uh, gets everybody what they need. It gets the athletes a livable, uh, a livable wage. It gets, you know, fans access to a, a product that they want to watch. It's available, you know, and marketed appropriately. Those are all the things that I think we need to see happen here. And, and hopefully they're able to make it happen. And the the product is really good. Like that's that's the thing where I don't it's I don't I don't feel like it's in the year twenty twenty four we shouldn't have to defend women's sports as a good product. But if, but inevitably you see responses on Twitter and social media and all that stuff, and you do it. It's a really good product. Like the game is the game was the the game is a really high skill level. You're talking. You're talking the best athletes in the world. I wrote, I wrote something this week over at EP Ringside about how the state of goaltending that league is ridiculous because you've got the 13th best goalie in the world as a third stringer in that league, and there's not space in the league for the 19th best goalie. It's just the, the competition is, is so good. And it's like, and meanwhile, on the NHL side, we talk about goal scoring up. Well, 94, go- 94 men have played in the NHL this year. Like, that's. Should should ninety are there ninety four individuals qualified to play goalie in the NHL? No, there's not. So um, the and it's 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 kind of on the flip side where the women's game is every single game you're watching two of the best ten goalies in the world and it's and it makes the it raises the entire skill level of the league everything like that. Um, it's it's a good it's a good product and I, I hope they figure something out. I hope Detroit ends up on the space here. I hope at a minimum that. In the short term, meaning next season, I hope that Detroit is again a neutral site game next year. Like I, I would hope that maybe Detroit and Pittsburgh and maybe a couple other neutral site games um, are still on the docket for next year because we saw the NHL. Uh, the NHL did this from ninety two to ninety four, I think it was. If you go and look at like uh, the the NHL played eighty four game seasons um, in between ninety two and ninety four, I think it was, and those were intentionally were basically. 
game 83 and 84 for most teams were neutral site games. Um, that's where they, the Dallas market, for, for example, the first ever NHL game in Dallas was between the St. Louis Blues and the New York Islanders. It was kind of a test, a test run of, okay, can this be done? And so I think using these next year as you kind of try to build this momentum, I hope that at a minimum, this game in Detroit this past weekend leads to a game or two games at LCA next year. I, I, I would hope for that because um, it's it's better for the entire sport. And it's uh, like, you, it's especially like in Michigan, right? We're talking about a, what I said, the fourth largest girls participation in the country for, for, for hockey. You should be, they should be, they should be included. So the product is good. The market is there. Just need to make the match happen. And so, you know, I, I, I don't really know that much else needs to be said on that. Just make it happen. Do it smartly. And make this the league that can be sustainable and continue and ultimately give everybody from the athletes all the way down to the fans, you know, what everyone's craving right now, which is just great women's hockey, which we have access to, you know, with this league. And so with that, I think that'll conclude our return of expected by whom, uh, you know, in terms of programming, what folks should expect is we'll get back to our regular schedule. Uh, we're going to obviously do the best that we can to stick to that. Um, you know, no promises, as we said from the very first episode, but we're going to do what we can to be right back on track. And if, as always, if you've got any questions, comments, concerns, please direct those to the direct messages of Ryan Hanna, who would be more than happy to handle them. All right, folks, take care.